Hello. <coughs> In our previous uh, lecture, we looked at uh, human resource function. Within human resource function, we looked at manpower planning, the recruitment and selection, the training, and today we will start examining the job related aspects as well as how job information can be linked to the compensation and the payment system. So, in this uh, lecture, you these are the learning goals. You should be able to see the definition and the concept of uh, job design, the different aspects of uh, job design, job specification in particular, and also the techniques of uh, job design in relation to the motivation and involvement of uh, employees. When we see job design, it integrates uh, the work content, it integrates the rewards and the qualification required for each job in a way that meets the needs of both the employees and the organization. So, in other words, what we are talking about is doing of the work is not monotonous, it is not a machine driven kind of an activity, it is much more a human focused activity. So, the individual efficiency, individual performance, individual satisfaction, individual growth is well understood or all integrated. But at the same time, integrating the requirements of the organization. So, the core concept of job design is breaking down various activities, analyzing and understanding of various activities, understanding the requirements of the individual, and putting it all together so that it meets the requirements the needs of the individual as well as the organization. I think that is the core of the job design. It is not just a job focus per se, but it is job as well as the human being who is doing the job as well. I think that is the view. So, when you see job design aims to make a given job required by the organization to the employee while retaining the benefits it brings to the organization. So, that means the organizational requirement is not compromised. At the same time, you are having a full concern on the individual who is going to perform the job. So, what we will do is to you know, convey, understand this, the, the the kind of evolution what has taken place over the years. But if you see in the first half of the century, in the, you know, uh, from 1850s to 1950s, you see around that time the, the employees, if you see the attitude towards employees were very, very authoritative. Employers felt that they are cog in the wheel. I think that is the concept. The employees were viewed as that they cannot think, they have no individuality, that means they are not any entity to be bothered with. All their focus, all their effort was on the, on the machine. So, employees were seen as obstinate and lazy people and then who had to be forced to work, what people call as the theory X kind of an assumption. That means, unless people are watched, unless people are, you know, be told, unless people are forced, the things will not work. But assumptions about people change over a period of time. So, people use this word from theory X to theory Y, where you believe that the people are basically motivated, given a chance, given a climate, given the appropriate guidance, people give their best. So, it is not that force, the stick approach is the best, but there are other approaches which are far more effective. 
Hence, that is where it is. It is the realization that that the attitude of very authoritative and people are lazy, things like that was totally wrong and people were seen as basically motivated individuals capable of taking responsibility and given such responsibility and challenge, people work hard and people excel, people contribute the most. So the job design principles were moved with this kind of a philosophy. So the modern job design takes note of these factors. And so the needs of the organization are seen in conjunction with the needs of the individual employee. So it is not seen as conflicting, it is not seen as where you, you see it as parallel lines where it cannot meet, so neither they are in conflict, they are not in parallel, but they have to, that means the individual needs as well as organizational requirements have to move together and those approaches only will give the required dividends. So the job design today is a kind of a means of finding a happy marriage between the needs of the organization and the needs and motivation of the individual so that both benefit from the committed attitudes of each other. I think that is the principle and that is the approach of the job design and the concern about the job design as well. So that means this task may involve the inclusion of the obvious motivational factors and basically developing that kind of a responsibility. And effort is also towards to see the demotivating factors on the job, which is like routineness, monotonous, repetitiveness, or the where there is not much of a scope for change of activities from one to the other, which brings the growth. All of these negative factors are seen as demotivating factors. So the demotivating factors must be minimized, must be avoided. So avoidance of demotivating factors is an important aspect, important principle of the job design and enhancing the contributing and motivating factors is another. As we see the job design, one can think of the three steps. The first, the specification of individual tasks, what are the activities to be done and the specification of the method of performance of each of the tasks and then the combination of tasks into specific jobs and that is to be assigned to the individual. And when we try and see this, there are many ways one can approach it. There are many aspects of job design. One can consider uh, several things either in combination or separately, but we will consider particularly the four important ones. The first one is the ergonomics, the second one is the work study, the third one is the principle of this consistency, then we will also talk about the, the job uh, specification. Each of these have a evolved into a major disciplines. So what we are going to cover is some of their quick, you know, basic philosophies and in a way what is that they focus on with respect to the job design. And those of you are interested should get into this as each of this have grown into a, a full-fledged discipline by themselves. If you see the ergonomics, Ergonomics is in a simple fashion can be defined as the study of the interface between human beings and the machine. It is the interface between the, the man-machine systems. So the man-machine system interface has been explored and studied by this ergonomics. The aim is to make this interface an efficient one and allow the machine to be operated at speeds controlled by the operator than the, than the interface itself. So the studies have focused on 
the various aspects of the individual purely from a physiological point of view. Sometimes it is the physiological as well as the psychological point of view and the machines have been studied in terms of the engineering principles. So that means ergonomics when you see interface also becomes managerial. Ergonomics has evolved as an interdisciplinary and a multidisciplinary approach to work on job design and job redesign and so you bring the principles of physiology, psychology, engineering as well as management and that is how ergonomics in combination delivers some of the best of the results and today the principles of uh, cognition, the principles of stress, the principles of the, the fatigue and learning has been incorporated on the one hand as the contributions of psychology. On the other, you are talking about the work and the work rest rhythm, the impact it has on the individual in terms of the physiological fatigue and the stress which can create and then we also see together in terms of the engineering how much of the human effort can be transferred to the machine, how much of the effort can be handled by different uh, control systems and then what is the role of the individual in relation to the machine and this has to be blended in a, in a systematic way so that the the whole of job design becomes most meaningful. So the ergonomics has grown over a period of time focusing on this, you know, the contributing by integrating the multiple disciplines and has emerged as a field to make sure that it is carried out in a systematic way. So it design, designing of an environment in which the job is well done and well carried out. So the examples are many. If you see the design of control consoles or instrument uh, panels for aircraft may draw very heavily on the concept of ergonomics. So that means several of the instruments in a cockpit, so the pilot is able to see most of it, able to reach out to the, to the all the required controls and making that kind of a minimum of the movement but without losing the sight of any critical information. Ergonomic principles are also there in most of the design of the, the two wheelers or the four wheelers. You can see with the least of uh, learning time people get on to the task and start driving. Whether it is the, the tall person or the short person or so many of these things are accommodated through a good understanding and deployment of the ergonomic principles. So that means for any given situation the ergonomic approach is first to understand the way in which the operator acquires information and also gives instructions or moves the control. A systematic analysis of this gives the idea of that human effort the human interface and the, the requirements of the task. The second is to characterize this kind of an exchange. So how frequently it is done, what are the kind of a movements, what is the physiological effort, what are the different senses we, the one would deploy in terms of eye seeing, listening or hearing. And use of the body pattern, by, you know, body movements, whether the, the kind of posture is involved, standing or sitting. So many of these things are systematically analyzed and understood. Then you see the kind of uh, interface in such a way that it permits an optimal change so that it is the best of the human efforts are taken into consideration. So an ergonomist so must have a thorough understanding of the physio physiology or the human body's capabilities. So the kind of uh, thresholds, 
the kind of uh, fatigue it brings in at different points of time, movement of uh, various, uh, 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 various uh, uh, muscles, the, so the one would systematically study this in the context of the job and the job performance. An ergonomist also see concerned with the optimal levels of lighting, so the or the shift lengths. So the work rest rhythms uh, is an important uh, consideration, and also the kind of uh, working conditions in terms of the heat, the noise, the workload, the the stress which is going to get you know, going to get created in the workplace. The ergonomics would, would look into the overall context of the work and specific factors which can influence the performance positively as well as negatively. So the, the other important approach is the work study. The work study means exactly studying the work and then in a systematic way. It is basically referred to the Taylorism of the early 1920s. The Taylor believed that there is one standard way of doing certain things, the doing tasks, and these things can be studied. And once it is studied, it it enhances the repeatability. It also helps for specialization. So the Taylor and the Taylorism moved this work study in a big way, so very clear benefits for the organization and also under the helps motivation of the workers because once well established the procedures makes people to learn and make sure that the learning is deployed in a consistent fashion. So the work study aims at the optimal methods of performance for a given job. So that means you understand all the movements, all the procedures and the procedures are standardized and such standardization helps in learning, in deploying and also doing the task day in and day out. So it involves consideration of the work and the machine or the other resources involved and integrating all this as a part of the work study. So it can take place in on any scale. So example could be the assembly of a watch. The work study engineer will consider things such as the distance of hand travel in picking up the components and also the optimum balance of the, the tools used. So that means uh, systematically one can see what is that movement. So it could be at the shoulder level or it could be at the table level. So then you also see the stretch involved in each of these movements and then you can see where to place the tools, uh, where to place the required material so that the minimum time you can maximize the output. So the, the, the good example is also the, the kind of the within the reach how much the more they can uh, deliver within the, within the shortest span. So the time is an important thing, the movements are important and also you will understand how much of these things can be standardized. In a shipyard the engineer might consider the distance each hull plate has to be carried how many hot river stations are required and how many times a particular point has to be visited and so on. So that means each of the movement, each of the processes are well understood and integrated and then the examples are taken and then, then you will see what are the movements not required in removal of certain activities and standardization of more, most of the things. So in other words, what is happening is today the work study has been broken down into the following three things, the method study, the motion study as well as the time study. So the, 
when you see what are the things deployed, how it is done as well as what is the time taken for each of the steps. So that means the three of the things of when it is integrated gives a kind of what is known as a standard manoeuvres, which is also called as the SMH, the standard manoeuvre that to complete this kind of a task. And standard manoeuvre becomes a kind of a basis for calculation of the rewards, calculation of the payment systems and things like that. That will, that will enable an objective analysis of the effort, objective analysis of the time and then linking this effort and time to the payment system. Consistency is another important dimension. So it also must be maintained over a period of time. So a job designer is bothered not a one-time performance. If a person gets enthused or highly motivated, they go out of the way and do deliver. It is good in a kind of a project mode kind of an organization or an event based organization. But a job designer so must see the consistency across the organization. It is not that some people work very hard and some people are uh, not doing much. So that means the job has to be distributed in such a way so that the difficulty level, the challenges level, the number of activities are distributed where it does not overburden some people and it becomes very easy and no effort at all for many others. So it is important to look at this aspect of uh, consistency. And as you see the consistency is that as skills develop, the individual must be able to move to a new task. So in order to use his skill sets, in order to use his uh, effort, we need to see how to put the jobs in a progressive way. A job designer must avoid the pitfall of uh, failing to acknowledge the advancing abilities and responsibility. So that means we assume that a, a job initially could be done by an unskilled employee, but then as it moves, the job can be done by a semi-skilled or a skilled employee. So the skill has to be integrated into the task as well as to the various aspects of the job. The skill match is an important dimension. I think that is where the principle of this consistency. So there is no point in increasing the motivational aspect of responsibility and authority without that kind of a, a kind of a raising remuneration to a level consistent with that kind of a new jobs. So the job difficulty also has to increase along with that kind of a learning, learning curve. The job specification is the next step. The job specification is to specify what we are talking about is completely. Job completely means one needs to include all the aspects that impinge on the job and then use this specification to, to various other activities. Four dimensions used to define any given job are the following. The job description and the contract of employment. So they are clearly, they are clearly documents, we clearly documented that specify what this job entails. So that means we are using these word duties and responsibilities. Of all the items included within a complete job specification, so the job description is often the only one a job applicant is clear about before accepting the job. So the level in which the people, the one would work the responsibilities, the authority, the kind of context in which the job is delivered as most of these things are described as well as the kind of person who can. So that means the level of qualification expected, the level of experience required, the, the essential as well as the desirable ones. So that is how the job description enables also the contract of employment where it gives the terms and conditions of work. 
the job specification also in relay we should see in relation to the standard course of practice for the organization. So many organizations have their own guidelines and codes of practice that affect the jobs within jobs, some of the things like what is desirable, the some of there is um, you know the breakdown maintenance versus the, the preventive maintenance. Some of the organization will have a particular safety course that have to be adhered to the to all the times. The kind of uh, safety devices that they are supposed to carry, it could be the helmets, it could be the shoes, it could be the gloves or it could be the washing of hands in a, or in a hospital wearing of certain particular uniform. So there are many of these codes have to be understood and to be integrated. And uh, also you have to see the, uh, the when we have to see the, the, the job specification should include some of the specific conditions. It could be about the meetings or the, the travel things required as well as away from the job context, the, from the job various things one need to do systematically. So that has to be maybe it's about the reporting or the document or the way one need to communications has to occur in terms of the reporting relationship also must be understood and stated. And similarly, the what we are using this word is a law that means you know the code of whatever it could be agreed upon by the management and the employees also makes a requirement to the employee, employer to see people in non-discriminatory way. And uh, it is uh, also make, making sure that it is legal. So it is the responsibility of the job designer to be familiar with what is this law stipulates in terms of number of hours of what one should work in uh, under the Factories Act and the kind of breaks what has to be given uh, under the industry practices or the agreed upon practices, but also the statutory requirements under the Indian uh, Factories Act and some of these things must be accommodated while uh, designing the specific jobs. And sometimes it is the Shops and Establishment Act defines the scope of the night work. Or length of the time what one can be deployed in a shift work. So these things must be understood and must be integrated. So the culture of an organization can have a profound effect on a job. The culture in terms of where people take it, you know, start the work at the right time, they are very efficient, they are highly focused on the task and the completion of the work also uh, is done in a systematic way. So there are cultures which are prone for good performance. Similarly, there are uh, situations where the workers are not highly motivated, they are lazy, they would like to use every opportunity to relax and such situations are there. The culture you know, tends to not to help not to help for effective uh, job perf you know, performance. So what is important is a good job designer tries to understand the culture and then try and see what is to be done so that the, con you know, particularly establishing the socially controlled issues. The people get into the, uh, getting into any non-routine activities where people can spend a lot of time in going and getting some material or uh, getting some form filled. So people may waste a lot of time and take much more time than what is uh, required. So it is important for the designer to see what is this culture of the skill. Are they good in reading? Are they very efficient in writing? Do they require a lot of time wherever the communication opportunities are there or when they go for any relaxation or the serious about time, 
or when they take a break and when they come back, do they spend more time as a kind of a what people call as a set up time? I think these are all part of the organizational culture. So the, the job designer has to look into this aspect and then integrate while the job specification is involved. Let us look at the, the technique of the job design as apart from this uh, what we talked about based on the ergonomics, based on the, the various uh, principles of uh, time, motion uh, and the work study, then also defining the scope of the work in terms of the responsibilities and duties, roles, what one is supposed to perform and also defining some of the very specifics of the work conditions in relation to the background of the employee in terms of the skill sets as well as the culture of the workplace. If you take a little more for, you know, get into the more design, uh, the, the details of the job design, one can also think of this uh, four important methods. One is the work simplification. The second one is the job rotation and the third one is job enlargement and the fourth is job enrichment. The, all these four have evolved as a set of principles in improving the context, also the performance of the job and aiming at integration of the individual needs as well as the organizational requirements. The work simplification is also supported by the other two thing is that the, not the autonomous teams and the high performance work design. I want to spend a little time on each of these things. When you see the work simplification, so the given job is broken down into small parts and each part is assigned to one individual. So in other words, what we are trying to do is to give a standardized part of the work so that the individual can progress in a systematic way in that particular task by doing it in a repetitive manner and through a specialization gets into the higher level of performance. So the work simplification normally is seen as enabling the workplace specialization. So it demands that the, the work is broken down means you know you have to see what are the inputs required and then what are the movements required, what are the integration efforts required and then what are the testing activities required. So most of these things are separated out and then you see within the time within the available infrastructure in the machine, what is that one can do. So the work simplification is uh, involves understanding the repetitive uh, work progress and uh, working on only one part of the product and then making sure the few skill set requirements, the few skill requirements so that the, the one can deploy and learn those skills in a very, very effective manner. So work simplification is adopted when job designer feels that jobs are not specialized enough and the, the generalization is not good enough. So that, that is where the one need to see done so that the less trained and the less paid employees also can do these jobs. So that means you take the pressure teach him or train him on particular task and then you can deploy that person onto the task as quickly as possible. So that the individual uh, deploys a skill, learns around that and moves and contributes around that. The, the work simplification has been seen as the most uh, useful method of integrating the young and new employees onto the task and then also move them systematically uh, to from one task to the other. But the job rotation is seen as the next improvement. That means it implies the movement of employees from 
one job to the other. So that means that as the people mature in a one skill set area, they are moved to the next one. And that moving of the next one is seen as part of the career development as seen as a kind of a developmental activities. So that means the employee performs different jobs, but more or less jobs of the same nature initially. But as they move up in the organizational hierarchy, they continue to do different tasks. And what people view the word multi-skilling. Multi-skilled employees are extremely important to build the organizational flexibility, numerical flexibility or functional flexibility can be enhanced by the people who are more generalist. So that means the job rotation is defined as a systematic movement of people from one task to the other to enhance employee, employee skill sets. So that means the focus is on the development of the employee's capability and such movements would help people to understand different tasks and also the methods of performing different tasks. Sometimes the workers don't like this because the, that they have to do more tasks and different tasks which they believe as a kind of an intervention from the supervisory levels. But once it is linked to their career progression and the reward systems, job rotation is always preferred by the employees. Some of the companies use job rotation to make employees to develop and develop into its uh, highest level of perfection, what people call as to create masters. So the job rotation is seen as a tool to create masters in the organization who can do all the jobs of the organization to its perfection. So the job rotation builds that require breadth and then doing every job for a minimum period of time also builds that kind of a breadth. So the breadth and the depth over a period of time helps people to master in certain areas or in certain organization where they can do all the tasks of the organization. So work specification is adopted when job designers feel that the jobs are not specialized enough. But then when we have seen the job rotation is the uh, is useful when you know the when people have to be moved and then when you want to create the multi skilled employees. Job enrichment with respect to the other techniques if you see it is to improve both task efficiency and human satisfaction. It comes from the theory of uh, Herzberg who talked about the two factor theory. That means every job has hygiene factor as well as motivators. The hygiene factors provide the the basically what we people talk about the working conditions, the nature of uh, supervision, the salary and many of these things would only can reduce dissatisfaction. If these things are absent, it creates dissatisfaction. If these are present, it leads them to a no dissatisfaction stage. Whereas the motivators are basically the variety, the identity, the challenge and some of these factors, these factors. And when these factors are present, it increases satisfaction. That means if there is no challenge, if there is no variety, if there is no identity, if there is no recognition, means there will be no satisfaction. But once these things are present, it increases the satisfaction. I think that is the principle what is involved in the job enrichment. So that means an enriched job will have more responsibility and more autonomy and also more variety of tasks and more opportunities. So how to build these things under the job is an issue of this job enrichment. So that means you are increasing 
the motivational value of the job and providing such opportunities. So the, the, that means you know, the, we are using the Hertzberg model, Hertzberg principle of uh, providing uh, the required things. So when you are talking about the job enlargement, it involves expanding the number of tasks or duties assigned to a given job. So in an enlargement exercise, you are providing not necessarily within that skill set, but also the additional work additional skill set to be used. If you see typically a receptionist would do the job earlier only as a receptionist receiving the customers and things like that. But today you will also see the receptionist would also work as the telephone operators come receptionist. And sometimes they also go beyond that they also complete some of the records of the organization. They also do some kind of a the, the security related work of the organization. So that means then the same task, same person now gets the additional things and so that they are more valued in the organization and providing that kind of a multiple task also enhances their own role and responsibility within the system. And that is how the, the various of these interventions of this job enlargement is is seen as that you are creating an opportunity for the worker to acquire more of the of more and more skills and so that they are becoming more important part of the workforce. But the job enlargement is opposite to the work simplification. In work simplification you are adding to the specialization, you are adding to the skill levels of the employees whereas here the the, the job enlargement is creating a, a variety of opportunities on the job to perform different tasks. So, but the, the one need to see which one most appropriate in the given uh, situation. Sometimes the breadth is very important, sometimes it is the depth is important. Work simplification as a kind of a specialization and specialized activities are seen in most of the engineering assembly and uh, machine building operations where people see that the specific simplified tasks are much more useful. Whereas in many of the office and office situations, it may be desirable to deploy the, the job enlargement principles. The other uh, technique which is used very extensively and mostly in the automotive uh, kind of a companies is the autonomous are also called as the self-directed work teams. See so the autonomous work teams, they, they define the task, they define the roles amongst the group members. So the job is seen in a, as not as an individual kind of an activity but it is seen more as a, a team or a group activity. So in that kind of a situation, particularly in an assembly line, the people may do different tasks, people may, depending on the kind of, you know, the kind of pressures. So the work team defines the pace of the work as well as the activities amongst the group members. So they are responsible for the whole work and the end deliverables then where you can evaluate for each of the task in relation to the, a specific employee. The self-directed work teams found to be most useful in the organization where they found that it is best left to the group and let the group take initiative to decide the quantity and the quality of work. So the autonomous work groups are in a way very useful in where you, it, um, you know, it deploys the principles of autonomy, it deploys the principles of the discretion to make decisions so that the group is charged, group feels that they are more accountable than it is externally controlled, externally directed. So the team members work together and then they cover each other for some of their difficulties 
and they handle the problems together. So that means there is a lot of learning amongst the group members and the team leader becomes a good enabler and the tasks are to be defined or to be seen at the team level. So that means it brings that kind of a required cohesion, it brings that kind of a required integration and then that mutually supportive relationship enhances the, the, the human relations and the human relations in turn contributes for performance and effectiveness. And the autonomous work groups have seen to be most uh, and the best in the assembly line operations, in automotive companies, also in task, in uh, some of the construction activities so that you go by the end results than what each one is doing at a particular point of time. However, one should not completely lose focus of the individual focus, the time as well as effort requirement. The high performance work design is, uh, is the current kind of a concern where performance in an environment where positive and demanding goals are set. That means people have to be more innovative, they have to be meeting some of the deadlines and some of the challenges. So people have to exert themselves beyond a point and then you know you see the routine definition, routine duties and responsibilities fail. And so the, you know, in other words that we are talking about the operational flexibility is important. You cannot, you cannot define the all the steps but you can define in terms of the broad expectations. So that means there is a need for employees to gain and apply new skills, new skills quickly and the, the, the focus is on giving that kind of a required autonomy but create that kind of a broad expectations. And the, what is important is these are all different uh, kind of interventions starting from ergonomics so that one can deploy the ergonomic principles one can deploy the work study, time study and the motion study as standard methods of understanding the task and the task requirements. Then definition, definition of the work itself in terms of the job specification, duties, responsibilities and the roles. And then one can also see the job rotation and various methods of uh, motivation in terms of the job enlargement the job, uh, uh, the job enrichment and deploying the, the Hertzberg models of motivation. And through these methodologies, one can see how the job can be defined both at the individual level and sometimes it is also desirable at the group level. So the autonomous work systems, autonomous work groups have uh, have also created newer methods of working. People call it as asynchronous working today when people have talked about the global virtual teams. So that means the global teams work not in a kind of a face-to-face -face mode but in other modes of working where they use technology to interact with each other. So newer job definitions, newer delivery models are coming into picture with the emergence of the technologies. So the job is at the core of our discussion and through the job and various interventions at the job level, we are able to create a healthy and effective organization. And such effort demands a multiple uh, approaches and interdisciplinary work. So today, the psychologists, the physiologists, the, the engineers have to work in tandem, in collaboration, deploying technologies, designing new techniques, designing new methodologies. Through that, understanding the requirements of the individual, enhancing some of their effort, minimizing some of the wasteful activities on the job, bringing that required specialization, creating the opportunities for growth through generalist 
where they can do multiple tasks and acquire multiple skill sets, creating more opportunities for employment and making employees more employable has been the focus of the job and the job redefine. And once these things are achieved, that the organization would employ highly motivated people and doing the kind of jobs and each of the jobs are well understood and well designed and contributing to the best of the organization. So in this lecture, we have seen the following, the definition and the concept of job design, the different aspects of the job design, job specification and also the techniques of uh, job design and when we move further, then we need to look into this, the depending on this kind of factors which affect the job design in terms of the complexity, in terms of the challenge, in terms of the routineness, in terms of the standardization, whether it is individual work or whether it is collective work, then we need to see the reward systems and the practices. And all of these things are influenced by the by the culture of the organization. And the culture need to be understood and should be addressed through appropriate reward and reward practices and the payment systems. I think that is what we will do in our next lecture.